welcome to today's Public Health Ontario Microbiology Rounds presentation on data science and machine learning for public health microbiology practice and research. My name is Vanessa Tran, and I am a clinical microbiologist at Public Health Ontario, and I have the pleasure today of moderating today's session. Before we begin, I'll just mention a few housekeeping items. Firstly, the chat pod has been disabled to limit any distractions during the presentation. So if you have any questions, please use the Q&A pod. A discussion and question period will follow the presentation. If at any point during the session you experience any technical issues, please email capacitybuilding at oahpp.ca. I would like to state that as the moderator of the session, I have some conflicts of interest to disclose. I am on the board of the Canadian College of Microbiologists and the board of the Canadian Association for Clinical Microbiology and Infectious Diseases. I am also a co-investigator or collaborator on grants funded by CIHR, CERN, PHAC, and Gilead. It's now my absolute pleasure to introduce the speaker for today's presentation, Dr. Venkata Duvery. Dr. Duvery is a scientist of Public Health Ontario and an assistant professor in the Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathobiology at the University of Toronto. Uh, Dr. Duvery leads a very exciting applied genomic and machine learning program to translate pathogen surveillance for enhancing public health practice and response and developing effective interventions. His research utilizes data science and machine learning and genomic epidemiology and phylogenomic approaches. Off to you, Venkata. Thank you, Vinisa, for the kind introduction. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining this talk. I'm a data scientist with experience in developing data science pipelines and building machine learning models. Some of the recent applications of my work include resolution of COVID-19 disease states and risk discovery for long COVID using electronic health data sets and multi-omics data. In my experience as a data scientist, I realized the need to educate subject experts on DSML principles to promote productive research collaborations. Keeping that in mind, I have created this slide deck that covers the entire data science machine learning pipeline, associated principles, and key data and modeling concepts in the part one. And part two covers some examples of uh, machine learning applications in microbiology. A decision is a crucial concept that involves making a choice or selecting one option among many. We use a mental model approach, which is a fundamental aspect of human cognition that plays a key role in decision making. Human mental models are constructs based on learnings from the real world, allowing individuals to make predictions and inform decision, uh, decisions in various situations through learning and testing. If machines are involved in the learning, the process is termed as machine learning. The most common machine learning models are supervised and unsupervised, where supervised machine learning models receive guidance from data. Deep learning is also a part of machine learning that uses a complex uh, algorithms resembling human brain networks, such as uh, neural networks. The current developments such as generative AI, and large uh, language models like G chart GPT are applications of deep learning. Involvement of machines in this entire pipeline from the learning to the decision making is called uh, as at, at artificial intelligence that is doing something smart. Data science and machine learning are in interconnected fields, but data science encompasses a wider range of activities related to data, while machine learning focuses on developing algorithms for learning patterns and making predictions from the data. Here are different definitions from the uh, definitions of the data science from IBM Statistics Canada and Harvard Data Science Reviews. Words that are highlighted in the green uh, do reflect interdisciplinary involvement of data science, involvement in the data science. Then I was curious about how chart GPT defines data science. It, it consolidated about, about definitions uh, in a line that is data science is, a, is the interdisciplinary practice of uh, extracting valuable insights and the knowledge from data using scientific methods, algorithms, and programming skills. Overall, these definitions reflect the importance of interdisciplinary collaborations in practicing data science. Data are, data are building blocks of uh, 
data science, building blocks for the data science that comes from various sources uh, in structured and, and uh, unstructured data formats. Data are typically in its raw and unprocessed form, presenting various listed challenges that need to be addressed using appropriate data science and data management practices that I will cover in the data science and machine learning lifecycle broadly. A DSML lifecycle is composed of four major stages that are executed iteratively. These, uh, these include starting from identifying a research question, data-related processes, model development, and finally to deploy optimal model. If splitting, if data, uh, first the uh, data splitting into training and test data sets is a common and essential practice. These subsets serve a specific purpose during development and the evaluation of machine learning models. In the, in the data pre-processing step, the raw and unprocessed data will be assessed using appropriate statistical and machine learning techniques to ensure data quality, handling missing values, treating outliers, dealing with inconsistencies, and transform the data into format that can be effectively used for exploratory data analysis. This exploratory data analysis helps to review data quality and grasp some data insights in relation to the research question. Once we are happy with the data quality, the next step will be the feature engineering. While data pre-processing involves, in, involves cleaning and preparing raw data for analysis, feature engineering is focused on extracting relevant information from the pre-processed data. Once we have prepared the data through, free, through feature engineering, we proceed to the uh, train, uh, training model building. This involves uh, selecting a suitable machine learning machine learning algorithm that matches the research question requirements. Then we feed the processed data into the model, allow it to learn patterns, relationships, and trends from the training data. The model parameters are registered are, are registered through hyperparameter tuning to minimize the error between the predicted outcomes and the actual target values. The best trained model will be identified based on the evaluation metrics. The model will be tested uh, using unseen using unseen data uh, with a hope to produce accurate results. This is an iterative process until we identify the best model. The deployment. Once the, the optimal model is identified, that can be used for real uh, real world applications for example classification predictions etc this model can be deployed through user friendly interface for end users to interact with the model and receive prediction uh, predictions or insights from the data sets this table summarizing the te uh, terminologies used across machine learning and microbiology domains Although these, these descriptors appear distinct in terms of terminology, these are known concepts shared between domains. For example, feature or attribute in machine learning corresponds to the independent variable. Label correspond, corresponds to the dependent or target variable in machine in microbiology at the data level. Now let's understand supervised and unsupervised model with respect to data. If we have a labeled data, we commonly utilize supervised machine learning models. Labels provide prior knowledge to the supervised learning model. Classification and regression are the common tasks in the supervised learning by using the different classifiers as listed. In, in this toy model, the, the research question we are answering is, can we identify species of newly, sub, newly submitted mosquito image data? This depicts the overview of the entire process of uh, supervised learning. We have access to labeled mosquito image data. A supervised machine learning model trained on labeled mosquito images can predict the, so the species of new, unlabeled, new unlabeled mosquito images. So the outcome will be species identification. If unlabeled data are available, that means only feature data we could use unsupervised learning to create clusters, associations, and dimensionality reduction by using the following classifiers. Unsupervised learning requires no prior knowledge or training data. 
In this toy model, using unsupervised learning, we can identify similar and or distinct clusters of mosquito image data based on the features. Once we have a uh, model development, we need to check its performance. Uh, so it can be done using the model evaluation metrics. Remember that the choice of evaluation metric depends on the specific problem and the type of machine learning task you are working on. For a classification task, we use confusion matrix to estimate accurate, uh, to estimate accuracy, precision, recall, etc. Accuracy, accuracy is the most common and straightforward metric that provides an overall assessment of uh, the model's performance. Accuracy can be misleading when dealing with the imbalanced data sets. Since model may be biased toward the, towards the majority class and fails to correctly, correctly predict the minority class instances. Hence, it is important to consider metrics based on the research question and the availability of data. For example, in scenarios where false negatives have severe consequences on the outcomes, recall becomes a critical uh, evaluation metric while precision to reduce false positives. Here are the uh, commonly used uh, libraries uh, for uh, libraries uh, for data science and machine learning. Uh, this concludes the part one on the basics of uh, data science and machine learning. In the part two, we will discuss a few, ex a few examples of machine learning applications in microbiology. I have conducted a quick PubMed, PubMed search using these keywords to learn, to learn the utilization of machine learning applications in translating microbi microbiological data for enhancing micro public health microbiology research and practice. Overall, I noticed 116 studies since 2009 and the use of machine learning has been increasing since 2009, uh, since 2019. I would like to walk you through these interesting machine learning applications where different types of data were used to address Time, uh, time ahead of disease spread of Zika predictions, the evaluation of machine learning models trained on the species identification and antimicrobial susceptibility test data to evaluate the antibiotic therapy of uh, patients who, who had invasive serious bacterial infections, and also, uh, and also summarized the existing AIML enabled medical devices that in microbiology that were approved by the FDA. In this study, authors' uh, interest was to develop a neural network tool for, for, the, for the time ahead modeling for Zika outbreak predictions. To implement and evaluate the model performance, authors used 2015 and 16 Zika epidemics in Americas. A range of multiple dimensional data, specifically epidemiological, passenger air travel data, uh, human population densities, vector habitat, and socioeconomic aspects were used. Coming to the selection of machine learning model, neural network was chosen due, uh, due, to, the, due to both the size and the complexity of the input variables and the demand for the nonlinear approximation. The model outcomes revealed a set of locations expected to be at high risk at a specified time point in future. That is n weeks ahead of prediction, ahead of prediction for Zika epidemic. The model performance was evaluated using recursive operating curves. The, uh, the ROC curves such as like blue and red, they highlight the superior performance of uh, one, one or two weeks ahead of predictions. Results from this uh, from this assessment, among all the all the variables, the prediction model revealed that case related data and travel uh, data as contributing variables to predict spread of Zika outbreaks for short short prediction windows. In the second study, and the authors. Uh, developed a novel machine learning model to extend the use of multi-top mass spectra, mass, spe mass spectra metric data beyond species identification to predict AMR directly from mass spectra profiles of clinical isolates. 
Maldit of mass spectrometry is a method used for microbial uh, species identification. This new technology is increasingly used for routine and clinical laboratories due to its simplicity, rapidity, and high throughput capacity. To train the machine learning model, authors utilize a large scale Maldit of mass spectra of clinical isolates linked with antimicrobial resistance phenotypes. This data set combines a more than 300,000 mass spectra data with more than 750,000 antimicrobial resistant phenotypes. Based on AMR, the, tar the target variable was divided into two labeled classes, uh, hence making this a supervised machine learning model. In the training model, authors utilized three different uh, machine learning, supervised machine learning models that are logistic regression, light gradient boost decision trees, and deep neural networks is followed by the model evaluation and assessing the contribution of features in, the predict, in predicting AMR. And in addition, uh, clinical impact of uh, machine learning model is also assessed by using a retrospective clinical case study. Authors used these uh, three clinically important pathogens and the associated relevant antibiotics to evaluate the performance of machine learning models in predicting AMR risk. For the three species they chose, the, the observed high AUROC indicates the class indicates the classifier is able to provide precise AMR predictions. For example, uh, staph aureus, uh, the prediction of uh, oxacillin antibiotic Reached, reached high performance with the AROC score 0 0.80. From these models, authors were able to validate previously known mass spectra peaks, which are relevant to AMR. In addition, this exploration led to the identification of novel mass spectra peaks that are linked, associated, that are likely associated with the AMR. These newly discovered AMR related information will further microbiological data, microbiological data and research, thereby improving its practice. Moving forward, the authors assessed the practical clinical utility of a top, top performing machine learning model. This evaluation involved the execution of a retrospective clinical study where authors examined uh, the antibiotic treatment regimens administered to patients afflicted with invasive severe bacterial infections. Let us review the study design and results. In this retrospective study, in this retrospective clinical case study, authors compared the standard care algorithm where infectious disease consultant recommends adjusted therapy based on the Maldit of species identification followed by phenotypic antibiotic resistance testing. This standard algorithm is compared to use of antibiotic resistant prediction model. In this, in this algorithm, infectious disease consultant had access to species identification plus predicted AMR data from the machine learning model to adjust the anti antibiotic therapy prior to phenotypic antibiotic resistance tests. Overall, for 80% of cases, the machine learning model supported the treatment regime suggested by infectious disease consultant. However, for nine cases, alternative antibiotic therapy would, would have been suggested by the clinician if the classifier was used at the time of the species identification. However, there are some discrepancies are also observed. The seven, for the seven cases, uh, model, model recommended a de-escalation of the uh, ID recommended therapy. For one case, model suggested uh, continue the current uh, uh, treatment, while ID consultant mentioned that escalation to the broad spectrum. And also my machine learning model uh, falsely predicted uh, uh, one case as a resistant. So in conclusion, novel ways to predict AMR in clinically highly relevant scenarios to promote the treatment resume. This slide gives summary of uh, the FDA approved AIML enabled medical devices across multiple disciplines using the, using the data publicly available on FDA website. 
this pie chart shows the application of AIML in different science, different scientific and medical disciplines with the radiology being the most. As you can see, AIML applications for, for, for devices related to microbiology make up a minor, minor portion of uh, this pie chart that is 0.96% and some of the approved applications are listed in the table. For example, APAS independence with a urine analysis, u urine analysis module. In micro microbiology laboratories, laboratories rely on the visual skills of the technologies to manual, manually read plates. This can be time consuming, inefficient, and subject to variation in results. The, the recent study demonstrated the ability of the APAS independence tool to accurately discriminate positive uh, from negative chrome agar MRSA and the staph RS cultures. The high negative predictive values indicate that cultures assigned as negative do not require additional technologist time. Because of the high false positive screening rate, a technologist is still required to assess all plates flagged as positive. This, this, this relatively small proportion of FDA approved medical devices rooted in AIML underscores several factors, including research gaps and the pressing requirement for microbiology domain experts and data scientists to work closely together in collaboration. In the time, in the interest of time, I am listing some of the publications that are that used whole genome sequences to predict antimicrobial resistance using machine learning applications. These research studies highlight the potential use of machine learning to accurately predict antibiotic susceptibility based on pathogen whole genome sequences. The, the research contributes to advancing our understanding of EMR and has broader implications for public health interventions and patient care. These are some, some of the key issues that were encountered when operationalizing data-driven uh, projects. Interpretability and explainability. In, in critical fields like healthcare, understanding how AI models make decisions is like interpretability. And providing human readable justifications for those decisions, explainability are crucial. Transparent models build trust, facilitate validation, and encourage ethical deployment. Privacy and data security. Protecting personal data is essential as data use as data uses grows. Uh, measures like data anonymization, encryption, and security is secure storage balance privacy with analysis, preventing unauthorized, unauthorized access or breaches. Ethical use and bias. Ethical data handling in artificial intelligence requires avoiding bias and discrimination. Mitigating bias during data collection, pre-processing, and model development ensures fairness and avoid decisions based on sensitive attributes. Computational resources and, eff and efficiency. Data tasks often need substantial computing power. Op optimizing resources use through techniques like distributed computing and hardware acceleration enhances efficiency for processing large data sets. Strategic collaborative partnerships. In the fields like healthcare, collaborations between organizations ac accelerate progress. Sharing data, expertise, and resources in partnerships drive discoveries and meaningful outcomes in data intensive domains. Training and education. Equipping professionals with the data analysis and machine learning skills is vital. Training and education enhance data literacy, enable, eff enable effective data utilization, and leveraging its potential. In conclusion, learning data science and machine learning concepts can be beneficial for microbiologists as it promotes data-driven research and practice. Histor the historical collection of routine microbiolo microbiology led to a large collection of uh, data sets uh, that can be explored using the data science and machine learning for enhancing public health microbiology practice. However, there are limitations ex uh, exist, like limitations of micro microbial data technologies, microbial data volumes and co complexity, 
and uh, encouraging the unique partnerships between microbiology, bioinformatics, and data science and machine learning uh, machine learning researchers. And the integration of public health and healthcare data with the data with the data science and machine learning applications will aid in uh, precision public health. Finally, these results. Uh, the uh, finally these uh, these results these slides reinforce my initial idea and motivation of this talk that microbiologists and data scientists should work in close collaboration for microbiologists it is essential to have uh, have at least a high level understanding of the AML pipeline to appreciate the potential uses of uh, machine learning in the lab to automate uh, lab to automate and gain insights Here I have provided some of the important references. And any further communication, Sophie, please contact the given email. So for the QA, for Q and A session, so I would like to uh, transfer to Vanessa. Wow! Thanks so much, Venkata, for that. Um very detailed uh, explanation of uh, data science machine learning. I, I definitely learned a lot. So now we'll move on to the Q&A segment of the event to address some of the questions from your audience. Uh, just a quick note to everyone that please continue to enter your questions into the Q&A pod if, if you have not already had an opportunity to do so, and we'll continue to monitor. So um, we have a couple of questions in the, in the chat box, and then I I have a couple of questions of my own, so hopefully we can get through them all because I think there's a lot of interest in this. Uh, so the first question is around the data set. So is there any generic data set that could be used to identify unknown species? So the example being and CBI blast. I think this is an interesting question. I think uh, the NCBI blast in the sharing platforms do have a multiple data sets. I think, uh, I, I think we have to really assess because there is no I, I never came across any such kind of work. And I think this is an interesting question to explore. I think, you know, we have lots of data, but, you know, one has to look into that, I think, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, there's a question specifically to the AMR prediction study. So do you know which markers were used by the machine learning to predict the antibiotic resistance and for which classes uh, they were and whether any false positives were detected um, and, and, and if there were, like, if they were in any particular classes of antibiotics? I think I can give you a, a kind of a, a general uh, answer on this one. So because uh, currently the machine learning applications are focusing on uh, predicting the MICs at the same time, you know, uh, uh, MICs using the WGS. And also some are coming up with some kind of KMR approach, you know, different approaches are using. Like currently we are in the stage of exploration so that... Uh, Yes, of course, there are when you are going with the different classes, different antibiotic classes, and also MIC numbers, you know, you see breakpoints, you know, there's a kind of uh, uh, limitations up there. I think how well we discriminate these uh, you know, MIC values or breakpoints, uh, there are a lot of limitations uh, are there. Uh, they presented in the papers itself. Uh, I think there, there was some success, but uh, how could we able to put it in the practice? I think we need more, uh, more, in, more research towards. Thanks, Vinkana. Um, so a question about chat GPT and whether or not you have any thoughts about how reliable it is in terms of its usage for coding. That is a good, very good question. I think I was actually exploring with the chat GPT by creating some codes and how it is giving me when I'm asking. So the, the only thing when I'm seeing that when I ask something in the text, you know, in the text, uh, it is, it, it is, it's not a human, right? It is giving you the information of what you want so that uh, if you want to know about influenza, I just say, what is influenza? It will give you information, but it can't give you kind of intricacies of the, the sentence uh, structure and everything. We, we need uh, human intervention is very important. Coming to the coding, yes, it is giving you a kind of uh, uh, understanding now how do you want to do so if you want to do some uh, some some question how to code that you can ask that question so it will give you it will navigate towards a direction so that it is easy for you to uh, for you to you know write the code uh, yeah um i'm just going to skip to one question just so we can uh in case anybody else has the same question is i think i think there's a lot you've generated a lot of interest and uh there's a question about whether or not 
people can email you after the presentation today. And if you're okay with it, um, our team will put your email into the chat box. And I would also like to sign up for a one-on-one -on -one tutoring session on uh, data science and machine learning, uh, just to try to understand a little bit more and how I can apply it to my practice. Um, okay. Yeah. So um, at the end of your talk, you alluded to something called precision public health. Can you just elaborate on what that is? Yeah, the thing is that uh, suppose if you take the current uh, public health normally, how are we doing our uh, our surveillance? Suppose it's, if you see that WGS uh, rapidly uh, is transformed the surveillance, you know, we experienced like we witnessed the SARS cow to pandemic. So. If you if we could able to combine the WGS with the clinical variables of the patient data, and it actually reduces uh, the the gap between the uh, between the public health and the uh, individual patient health itself, so that uh, we can able to see. Suppose, for example, why 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 a particular individual is is uh, is is having a multiple or recurrent uh, infections? You know, it, suppose if it, it's a, just a question I'm throwing. So that uh, we can able to, how could we how, how could we answer that one? So if we have a individual uh, clinical data or medical data, we could able to associate them with the uh, you know pathogen uh, pathogen genomics, so that we could able to connect those dots to understand what variables are actually promoting that infection. You know, is it because of the treatments or because of the particular pre-existing conditions? These all things maybe we, we could understand this. That actually reduces the gap between. And then we can actually, you know, come, uh, you know, better provide the information, you know, why why this is happening. Yeah. I guess along those same lines, there's another question around, like, what do you see the role of open source and, and data science machine learning for use in public health? I think you alluded to some of them in your presentation, but maybe um, just more broadly. There are, I, I think, as, as far as I know, because even I worked in the in an industry that, you know, uh, I don't see many of those open source applications currently, but there are industries that are actually working towards, you know, developing uh, this kind of prediction models to support. There are, there are private industries. Uh, yes, of course, maybe, maybe we'll come up with a kind of, uh, you know, developing the pipelines, you know, in order to, suppose, in order to utilize the WGS and EST data available, like, we can combine, you know, country level data or international data sets. Then we can develop a kind of uh, pipelines that may be implemented, you know, across uh, the countries or provinces or anywhere. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so the next question, I think I, I had a similar question, so maybe I'll ask this one, and I'll see if um, I maybe more generalize it. So the question is. Um, I think you touched on some of the, the key considerations or challenges, but what would you deem are crucial considerations to have in mind when implementing AI or machine learning um, in an organization? Um, as there are several AI tools out in the market, like, you know, I think everybody knows, well, every, everybody likes to talk about chat GPT, um, but in terms of like privacy and data would be, you know, really important considerations. Yeah, of course. Yeah, privacy data and uh, and also the utility of the and, you know ethical use of the AI is also very important. So that it is it is not the one one person show, and it is kind of that's what I'm seeing here. You know, it's a teamwork. You know, how well the dip different departments, you know, subject experts, IT side, you know, data scientists, and you know, all. I think I think it is kind of a, a you know, uh, teams work, I think, how well we, we come up with those solutions, yeah. We, we are at the early stages, so that uh, I think uh, finding out uh, those uh, mechanisms are very, very important, I think, expanding those. And I, hope. I guess along those lines, like, I'm just, um, I have a question in terms of, like, you highlight some applications, so AMR prediction, as, as uh, Zika distribution, by our, uh, mosquito distribution, but are there key considerations in terms of thinking about like uh in terms of the applications like if if a lab wanted to identify an application where they wanted to apply machine like data science ma machine learning are there you know just general considerations of which ones would be most amenable to that application so for example do you need a lot of data or um does it need to be does there need to be some kind of automation in place um, so just to kind of, I try to identify, like, I'm just thinking from a lab perspective, like, oh, these are areas where we can apply uh, data science, machine learning, AI. 
Exactly, Vinisa. I think here, here, that's what I'm. The first thing is that uh, there should be an active collaboration between micros and the and the data scientists. The number two, yes, we really need the data. Like, if you don't train the model well, you know, if model can't see the much data, much more information, it can't able to give you good predictions. But developing those, like whatever data we have currently, you know, developing on that, you know, so that we are we are we are making up ready for the future so that uh, we can design all the pipelines and you know, what data sets we have because it is prospectively we collect the data as being a microbiology labs you know they prospectively they collect the data so adding that testing those information is very important it is a it is a, it is a continuous process until we we hit a you know the good spot yeah I, I, that's very important and the development is very important now yeah I will come back to that. I'm just going to address some more uh, comments and questions in the chat pod. So there was um, just a comment to suggest that uh, Kathy O'Neill's uh, weapons of math destruction as, as a good read in terms of understanding the downside to big data approaches. And then there was another question, again, I think relating to um, uh, like antibiotic stewardship in AMR. So do you know of any working tools that helps with the prediction or of uh, of recurrent infections for the purpose of antibiotic stewardship. I I I did not see any of those those the, except these papers you know like uh, a couple of papers published on the on the multiple bacterial infections uh, using the AST data. I think that is that is what I think you know they they were successful and you know, they have shown uh, the success at the same time they mentioned about the limitations and you know, how could we. Uh, you know, overcome those. Those I think uh, we need to have, like you know, if we have only Ontario data set and the particular pathogen may not be enough. You know, like you know, maybe we need to have a comprehensive understanding of that. So, yeah. Thanks. Um. So the next question is a very good question, and I think try to answer it as best you can. But uh, what are your recommendations for getting buy-in or responding to pushback for machine learning in public health? So, do you think, uh, like you know, we are in the we are at the juncture now. You know, we have the uh, power of machine learning with us. Like, do you want to utilize that? Uh, uh, you know, it depends on how do you see the future and the and the development. You know, it is that is what. I suppose if you see the bioinformatics in you know, a way back in twenty ten or 2009, we have the same. We 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 were in the same situation. You know, uh, how well we can able to utilize this down the line. So it took it ten years to see the the empire importance and significance of WGS now. So this is what I'm thinking about as a as a public health scientist. I'm thinking about, uh, you know, implementing and you know slowly you know conducting research and exploring utilizing the existing data sets, you know, so that we can design the mechanisms, how this will be operatable in the down the line. So whatever the this development years will help us understanding the, uh, you know, risks and also limitations and developing some solutions on that. So we will be ready by the time when we really want to implement this, these applications for the, per, yeah. Yeah, and I think you great up, bring up a really great example with WGS. I think with any new technology, um, there's, I wouldn't say resistance, but I think people just need to become more familiar with how it's, how it can be used safely. Yeah. Um, I think highlighting, um, you know, key instances where it can be used successfully would, would help in terms of getting buy-in. Um, so the last question is around clinical lab standards, and it's actually a question, similar question that I have. So when we're thinking about um, adopting this type of um, process in, in a clinical lab, we think about standardization, and if there's standardization, it makes implementation more feasible. So do you know of any regulations regarding AI or machine learning, which the clinical lab standards should adopt? And maybe just a more general question is whether or not you think that um, machine learning and AI would be amenable to some sort of standardization, which we see now is trying to have, um, is trying to get implemented for whole genome sequencing. Yeah, two things, Vanessa. I think my, I, I don't have the. Uh, I don't know. I, I, my my answer is no. But you know, I I would you know, I'd like to ch chime in on this one. Suppose if you see if you see the research purpose, you know, we have data, we have machine learning models. You know, we can we can start working on that. You know, start to uh, you know exploring that. You know, designing those things. You know, with a big picture and the down the line. At the same time, there are some areas we we if you want to 
touch those things like we really need to pass through the privacy or some kind of ethics you know when you're implementing or when you're doing some some particular areas maybe they are more sensitive so it all depends on you know we have to see what is the the feasibility of of any task that can be doable you know like if there are any uh, you know, uh, tough situations. Maybe we have, we need to identify the uh, different mechanisms for that. So my my understanding is that we have to start building what we have currently. Utilize those data sets. You know, they're like we like EHR. We have a massive data sets. You know, in in with us currently, right? You know, with the, most of the labs, they have a lot of data. Like the historically collected data sets. Why can't we utilize that knowledge because of this machine learning? So yeah. Yeah, and I, I think what I hear you're saying is that data science, machine learning, AI is still in the infancy in terms of ad adopting it to clinical practice and public yeah. health. Um, and so along those lines, you mentioned I, this. I'll ask one last question before we start wrapping up. Um, you know, a, a gap that you identified was better need for collaboration and, and integration. So yeah. how do you envision that type of collaboration would occur? Like we at PHR are very lucky that we have yeah. the here, an expert in, in DSML. Um, but for, for labs or for organizations that do not have a data scientist or machine learning or someone specialized in it, like how would you envision that collaboration? At what point should you be brought into the process or, or even just before the process in terms of the creative thinking around how it can be applied um, to the lab and public health? Yeah, one thing is when you say as I as I motivated on this talk, you know, the the the, the scheme I created here so is that education is very important. First of all, you know, microbiologists, you know, those who are sitting there, you know, they need to have a question so that they can they can provide a dialogue with a data scientist. Otherwise, as a data scientist, I, I may not come up with the, the problem what you are having at the lab, right? So you can see, oh, this is the issue. This can be handled by using the machine learning applications. Like, you know, if you can. Can you, if, if you can provide me that scenario, I can able to say that, oh yeah, we can we can apply this one to in order to do what data sets we want. Do we have access to those? You know, that goes into the privacy and ethics, you know, what kind of data we want, how complex it is that. You know, this is how it, it, it works normally. Across the, as you said that, you know, if the organization without uh, data scientists or machine learning, so still there is a way to collaborate between the organizations so that it helps actually, because we can combine the data sets between organizations, but still as a as we notice that privacy and also are there, but you know, we can combine the data set, that's very important in order to, uh, you know, teach these machine learning models. Okay, so, I saw one last question come in, so I'll take this one last question and then we'll wrap up. Yeah. Um, so the question is, how do AI and machine learning approaches differ from traditional epidemiologic and biostatistic approaches? That's that's a very interesting question. Like if, if a person trained in the epidemiology or the biostatistics, the, the pipeline is almost similar. The only thing is that machine learning, we need to understand the intricacies within the algorithms in the machine learning algorithms and also they will give us a lot of flexibility in order to play with the different uh, simple to complex data sets so that we can do with with epidemiological or stat, uh, you know biostatistical models that is the only thing like if if a, if a trained epidemiologist or a biostatistician yes they can easily understand the process of this machine learning yeah so further you know having some kind of a coursework will help Thank you so much. Um, so thank you so much, Venkata. I want to thank everybody for sending in very thoughtful and intelligent questions. I think we had a really great discussion today. I think one of many discussions we'll have around data science, machine learning, and AI. Uh, but we'll wrap up today's session. So as we wrap up um, today's PHO microbiology rounds, I would like to thank you again, Venkata, you. for presenting. I would also like to thank everyone who joined us today uh, for today's webinar. You can expect to receive a brief and anonymous PHO micro round survey for today's session. Um, I please, I really highly encourage you to complete it at complete the survey as it really helps to improve our programming. Uh, and lastly, to access past PHO presentations uh, and to view confirmed and upcoming sessions, please visit the PHO website, head to education events, and click on presentations. So thank you again, everyone, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you, Anissa, and uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Mm -hmm.